We're here with Alex Malashev from uh, New York, Carter, Levy, Beard, and Milburn. That's correct. That's that's where we are. We're actually physically in New York as opposed to my um, apartment in New Jersey. <laughs> Great. You know, I I came in as well. Uh, uh, you know, you got you got to get out of the house sometimes and put on the button-up shirt. So this is as good as right. this is any. I, it, it's a pleasant surprise. It still fits. Yeah. <laughs> So Alex, I, I think as I've mentioned, what we're doing in this series, we're, we're really looking to get an understanding of, of the cannabis, legalization of cannabis, the regulation of cannabis. They're, they're not necessarily synonymous, but but they go, they're, they're related. And we're seeing a trend worldwide. And we, we've been seeing this trend occurring and coming since, uh, you know, I was suspecting the US since 2014 with Washington and Colorado, um, Uruguay, which was, uh, I think 2014, around that same time, Canada 2018, and I, I'd be surprised if a week or a month doesn't go by and another it's another thing on a state's um, election, uh, you know, platform or docket. So what we're really trying to do is just understand, I would say, and maybe you can explain to me what the framework looks like in the U.S. generally, but how has the U.S really gotten to this stage in its current iteration of, of legalization? Sure. Um, so this is a, you know, the U.S. is uh, in some ways very easy and in some ways very difficult. So as a practical matter, uh, there is uh, some um, deference to states and quite a lot of deference to states. But on a federal level, legally, uh, cannabis remains uh, completely illegal. Uh, it is. Um, the same as any other Schedule I drug. So the U.S. has a um, federal statute, the uh, CSA, which is its implementation of the U.N. Product protocols and has schedules very similar to what's uh, at the international level. It was adopted in the 1970s. It, it tracked uh, what the U.N. protocols say because the U.S. was actually a major proponent of them as part of the sort of larger war on drugs. Uh, cannabis actually ended up on the most restrictive list. Uh, so Schedule I uh, is reserved for drugs that are have a very high likelihood of um, abuse and dependence, and uh, importantly, have no medical use. Uh, now, that seems anathema considering uh, almost every state in, in the United States has some version of medical cannabis, at least the vast majority of them do. Uh, some have gone to adult use, but as far as the federal government is concerned, uh, cannabis is uh, completely illegal because he has no medical use. There is some movement afoot to force the DEA, which decides which schedule the drugs are on, to move it to schedule two, which would make it medicinal. Um, that would obviously change the industry in a big way. Uh, we are not there yet. There are some lawsuits uh, that are trying to prod them along, but um, under the sort of administrative code, um, there's a lot of deference to the DEA and they're just sort of taking their time. Um, that is sort of the uh, 30,000 foot view. Uh, but as you get a little bit closer, um, the practical uh, considerations are different. Uh, as you sort of mentioned in 2014, uh, there was a movement for legalization. And at around the same time, during the Obama administration, uh, two important policies came into, into force. Uh, and uh, they are the Congressional Writer Memo. It's colloquially known as a Robacher Amendment that is named after its first sponsor. It, it first came into force in 2014. Uh, it's now known as the Blumenthal Amendment under the current sponsor. But basically what it is, is a congressional spending writer so uh, every every year, Congress adop adopts a federal budget and allocates funds to its myriad of agencies, including the Department of Justice. Uh, the Department of Justice is prohibited from spending any money on enforcing uh, the CSA with respect to cannabis only for medical use states. And the, and the number of states that are listed in that congressional rider gets longer and longer every year. Uh, but what it does is prevents the DOJ from expending any funds in prosecuting companies that are operating in accordance with state law that is medicinal. Uh, that is not adult use. It, it's really limited to medicinal. Uh, but that has led to some case law uh, out of the 
uh, Western United States, the Ninth Circuit, uh, that actually has stopped some prosecutions and some seizures. Uh, that has not been um, adopted nationwide because it hasn't gone to our highest courts. Uh, for those who are outside of the United States, uh, the United States is exactly what it sounds like. It's a collection of states, 50 of them, uh, plus uh, various territories and possessions. And each has a dual sovereignty system. So we have state governments that can pass laws, and we have the federal government that sits, sits sort of on top. Um, and uh, under our constitution, the federal laws um, are still supreme to the state laws. So even if something is state legal, uh, if the government has taken the position that it, it sort of uh, controls the field, federal law controls. And as a result, while something might be legal at the state level, it can still be illegal on the federal level. So Alex, what what is, so I understand that there um, you know, are these co congressional tools that stop enforcement at a, you know, in law, federal law enforcement from going um, after medical cannabis industry participants. What's stopping them from going after adult use industry participants? Right. So the second thing that came around in the 2013-2014 timeframe was the uh, memorandum from the Department of Justice to its uh, AUSAs. Uh, it, it's colloquially known as the Cole Memorandum. That is a uh, direction uh, to local ju uh, Justice Department officials on how to exercise their discretion in using their limited funds. And what it basically said, at least starting in the Obama administration, was uh, we have bigger fish to fry than going after people who are um, complying with state adult use and medical uh, use uh, cannabis laws. So as a result, here's a list of priorities. And the priorities uh, are, first and foremost, uh, making sure that there's no illegal diversion of uh, cannabis to minors, uh, to uh, organized crime and across state lines, which is a very big one. So that's why the cannabis market is very siloed in the United States. Uh, but it said you should not uh, use your, your limited budget on doing this. Instead, you should go after people who are otherwise violating the law. Now, importantly, this was completely discretionary. It was just guidance on how to uh, exercise that authority. Um, it actually got rescinded in uh, the opening uh, days of the Trump administration because uh, Jeff Sessions, who was our attorney general for what seemed like two weeks, uh, was not a proponent of uh, cannabis legalization. In fact, he was a very big opponent. Uh, what he did was rescind the memo. Uh, now, he didn't say that they should go after cannabis uh, companies. What he said was uh, discretion means exactly what discretion says. And as a result, you should uh, use your discretion uh, and you're not going to have this guidance in force. As a practical matter, very little seemed to have changed. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, first of all, uh, that guidance that uh, uh, Cole put out was itself based on uh, guidance that's already in the um, a manual for AUSAs. In fact, that's publicly available, but uh, like any government bureaucracy, uh, the Department of Justice has sort of operating procedures and best practices. And uh, there are best practices about how to utilize limited uh, uh, assets of the government. And it was generally in, in, in compliance with that. More importantly, uh, the Cole Memorandum uh, priorities made their way into the Department of the Treasury's uh, FinCEN program, which is the uh, anti-money laundering arm of the Department of Treasury. They are the ones who uh, the SAR reports go to from various banks. So when they gave banks guidance on how to uh, interact with state legal cannabis businesses, they've incorporated uh, verbatim the Cole Memorandum. That FinCEN guidance actually never got rescinded, so it's still in force. And uh, to my knowledge, there hasn't been a prosecution that has materially departed from that guidance. Uh, there have been subpoenas, um, and uh, people probably know about the Weed Maps subpoena in, in California. Um, uh, that seems to have been occasion, or at least what attracted the government was actually departure from those uh, guidance. Uh, they were pretty flagrantly, apparently, uh, for a while, uh, listing 
uh, unlicensed cannabis businesses uh, because California's enforcement was so lax at the time. Uh, they got into a bit of a, a headbutting match with uh, California and that attracted uh, the Department of Justice. Uh, in addition, um, what happened uh, recently were a couple of um, gentlemen associated with ease got uh, convicted of money laundering for trying to avoid some of the reporting related to cannabis, even though some of it was uh, state legal cannabis, uh, access to banking uh, is very limited and access to credit cards is non-existent. Uh, they were attempting to assist those businesses in uh, accessing that by creating dummy corporations that in fact engaging in money laundering, which is what they can, got convicted of. So while the federal government has generally a more or less of a hands-off approach uh, to, can to businesses that comply with cannabis laws, once you step outside those lines, uh, you pretty quickly find out uh, they are actually still watching. So you raise an, an important point because uh, I'm, I'm kind of struggling here. Here in Canada with the legalization, we had some banks that just didn't want to touch it and still don't. And but most most have said, okay, you know, it's it's legal here. We're well, let's go for it. What? Because I know it has an impact and it and it does and it's going to lead directly to my next question. Um, but how does a company that engages in legal in-state cannabis commerce bank? So it doesn't bank with your big Main Street banks uh, that you think of, uh, you know, Chase, Bank of America, et cetera. They will not touch that. Uh, it's, it's a business uh, risk decision. Um, they receive the same guidance uh, from FinCEN that every other bank has received. Uh, but uh, there are banks that are the more comfortable than others in doing this. And um, the numbers of FinCEN reports uh, inflate that number. But I think at any given time, there are about 60 to 80 banks in the United States, banks and credit unions, uh, that will bank uh, the cannabis industry. Uh, they will bank a licensed cannabis businesses in general. Um, and uh, more of them will bank cannabis adjacent businesses than, than direct cannabis businesses. So businesses that touch the leaf have a harder time uh, finding banking services than some uh, cannabis adjacent businesses. Uh, but there are a number of them. Like a, like I uh, of a you know cannabis adjacent like I understand the cannabis company would be your you know your operators and what would be cannabis adjacent that might find themselves kind of walking the line then? Sure. Um, let's see. Um, uh, so a cultivator would be obviously cannabis touching uh, operation. Um, the company that supplies it with the uh, grow house lamps would be a cannabis adjacent business. And you have to take a step back and think about uh, the bank's anti-money laundering concerns. Uh, they have to monitor all of this. And if the revenue is ultimately derived from the sale of a, an illegal substance, they need to be able to track it. So the company that makes the lights uh, for the grow house um, needs to report and, and, and will likely get flagged as cannabis adjacent uh, and they should be uh, proactively telling their bank about it. Otherwise, if the bank finds out on their own, they will probably terminate their relationship. Uh, but the money itself um, is still derived from the sale of cannabis. And uh, you know, a, a very zealous uh, enforcement of the laws um, would actually sort of capture people the further, further you get away from the bud because you are still tracing the money and the proceeds of an illegal business. Yeah, that's... Uh... It's it's some fine line walk, and I can see. And 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 if I'm understanding correctly, it, it, this is the, the the you know sort of letter of the law. There is still the possibility, or or the, the the federal government does have the ability to enforce these laws. It's almost a political choice that it's making, or maybe even like you mentioned, a economic choice that it's making to focus elsewhere. Is that fair? Uh, I would say that is absolutely fair. Uh, is you know, 100% accurate for um, adult use. It is purely the discretion of the uh, prosecutors. Uh, the congressional writers and and medical use have a little more teeth, and that seems to be an actual uh, affirmative choice of the legislature to at least relax, if not uh, totally 
uh, rescind the laws. At least that is the interpretation the New Jersey Supreme Court recently took in a decision where it actually uh, forced a um, insurer to reimburse uh, somebody for medical cannabis use. Uh, they they took the federal government's uh, stance of now going on seven years uh, of uh, prohibiting their own enforcement arm from uh, prosecuting those businesses as at least a softening of its stance, uh, which some courts found enough wiggle room to enforce some contracts that are not otherwise enforceable. Gotcha. So, so Alex, you know, we the way that the U.S. has gotten to its current state today um, of, of legalization has been a, a a bit of a you know let's call it a quilt with states kind of joining in and making it less tenable for the federal government to expend its its limited resources on on enforcement if the states or the the you know the, the voters in, in in certain states have said this is something that we want and uh you know pretty much leave us alone so that's how you you've kind of gotten there so how would you describe uh, if you could the current state of legalization in the in the u.s Sure. Um, I, I think contrast with Canada is actually uh, sort of a very easy way to do this. If you think of Canada, it's, it's a top-down approach. You, you legalize it at the federal level and gave some discretion at the state level how to enforce it. So you have a uniform law with, uh, with some variations at, at the uh, you know, provincial level. Um, but it, in general, that allows somebody to operate nationally uh, with some discretion that, you know, uh, about how you do it at the, federal, at the uh, local level. Uh, the U.S. has been a bottom-up approach, uh, so we have, think about it as 50 different laws, um, you know, with, a, with an overlay of federal law, which is basically not enforcement. Uh, that makes it very different from somebody, for somebody to operate in states, you know, New York and New Jersey, and even neighboring Pennsylvania, which at this point only has a medical uh, use. Uh, that has created a silo, siloing effect. Now, uh, you know, businesses are as creative as, as you can imagine. So uh, we had, a, uh, while you guys have operating companies, we've gotten um, multi-state operators, MSOs, which basically um, invest uh, in a siloed approach, but they have a sort of a parent at the top level. Uh, what it creates, honestly, is inefficiencies and it, it drives up costs. Um, one of the big things that even though the federal government said, um, we won't enforce or, uh, you know, we'll take a hands-off approach and we won't, uh, you know, come in to uh, physically stop. Uh, what they haven't done is adjusted their uh, tax laws in any way. So there is a section of the uh, tax code, uh, section 280E, uh, which uh, makes it impossible for cannabis businesses to deduct most expenses. So it, it makes it uh, be because they're the proceeds of a crime. Um, and, you know, uh, as Al Capone found out, you have to pay your taxes. So uh, as a result, it's actually a lot more expensive to operate in this, in this space. And that really has um, created some difficulties for, for a lot of states. Uh, we are now having a really big movement towards um, social equity and correcting some of the uh, sins of the war on drugs. And part of it, uh, states are trying to make it easier for people who've been impacted by this sort of war on drugs to participate in, in, in the, in the um, you know, movement towards legalization. It's expected to be a giant industry. Uh, the problem is practical in a lot of ways. Um, it's a really expensive industry to enter into, uh, you know, in, especially in states that have a, number, limit of, uh, a limited number of licenses, which is really most of them. Uh, there are some states that are an exception. I believe Oklahoma went sort of uh, very, uh, you know, anyone who wants a license will get it, uh, which may run afoul of, of sort of the enforcement priorities in the coal memo. But in states where licenses have uh, tangible value because of their availability, uh, that makes it actually a lot harder for some of those social equity applicants because what they don't have is really the ability to engage in the type of banking that is already expensive. So you're paying thousands of dollars in monitoring fees a month just to have a bank account. Um, for, for a plant touching business. Uh, it gets cheaper the further away you get from the plant. Uh, you also don't get uh, some of those very same um, deductions that you would get in a regular business. So um, many states have tried to, to have a social equity component 
Um, many of them have failed. Uh, New, New York is trying. Uh, we'll, we'll see how it turns out. Um, they've tried to reserve a number of um, licenses for uh, social equity applicants, but we'll have to see in three to five years whether they can actually run the business um, because that's that has been expensive. And uh, you know, enforcement at the state level is also an issue. Uh, California took a very hands-off approach to enforcing its its cannabis law, so it really didn't uh, hammer people for operating um, non-licensed dispensaries. Uh, what that has created actually is problems for the state legal uh, dispensaries because uh, they are competing with people who are not under the same regulatory and monetary burden. And um, as a result, uh, now they're sort of trying to put the genie back in a bottle and it's been difficult. So uh, we sort of have this, these ex 50 different experiments going in 50 different states, 40 something, uh, there, there's still a few holdouts, um, but it's, it's a very um, targeted approach that you have to take to operating in a particular state. Just because you're operating in one state does not necessarily mean you'll be able to translate it into operations even in the neighboring state. Um, and um, that makes it very exciting for, for lawyers um, if, you're, if your uh, state gets legalized, but it, it makes it harder and more expensive for, for companies to operate. And, and so with that, Alex, you're, you're touching on the, my, my final question or my final discussion topic, which is, you know, what, what is coming or what ought to be coming with, with, the, with the legalization as it stands today? And so you've touched on inefficiencies that are created um, through this, you know, the, the, the mishmash of legal, of, of legislation. You've touched on um, obviously the, the unfair competition in certain areas. Um, and, and I think this is a question that, that I certainly have as a, as a Canadian next door is, is federal legalization the way to resolve a lot of this? Or is it something that, you know, just all the states or once all the states get together and, and say, you know, we're legal here, this is like, what, what, what does the industry need and what is it likely to get in order to, to help it keep growing and thriving? Sure. Uh, and look, if I if I really had the answer to this, I'd probably be doing something else for a lot more money. But uh, my, my best guess is uh, look at hemp. So the U.S. Um, in 2018 uh, legalized hemp, which in Canada, uh, the way you approach hemp and CBD, you consider it cannabis. Right. And it, those are cannabis derived products. Uh, the U.S. through legal fiction has uh, determined that uh, low, low THC cannabis is not cannabis at all. It is called hemp. Uh, and as a result, anything you derive from it, uh, subject to some exceptions that are trying to catch up to the speed of business, um, is not a controlled substance and got taken out of the Controlled Substances Act. Um, that did not remove the federal government. What, in fact, it did was bring in the FDA. Uh, so there are federal regulations that, that right now uh, state legal operators are not complying with because as an illegal substance, they're not subject to federal regulation, or at least they don't worry about federal regulation. Uh, being illegal is, is worry enough, uh, but there will be national standards for certain things. And the industry is not going to like how quickly or slowly the federal government moves, even once it takes that step. And uh, you know, maybe COVID was a distraction, but, you know, the FDA is still working on uh, CBD regulations. It has now been uh, three years. Um, in fact, that's not all that slow. Uh, you know, I think the expectation is, uh, you know, anywhere between three and five years. So once, uh, once it becomes federally legal, um, they, uh, there will be some um, debate about whether uh, the federal government will preempt uh, certain areas and, and, or sort of set a standard that if, if you need it, uh, then you complying and it's sort of the way it works with uh, other industries. Uh, but state level protections are still going to be there. Uh, things like consumer protection, 
false advertising. Uh, perhaps testing will be done at the federal level. Um, I, I have spoken to uh, state level uh, regulators and, and, and people working in their labs. There's nothing more than they would like to do than, than shuffle this off to being somebody else's problem. Uh, you know, they have other things to worry about than, than being the uh, regulator that tests uh, cannabis products, but there needs to be some sort of standards that are going to be set. So. Um, my prediction is we're probably going to go to schedule two before we ever go to um, uh, recreational legality at the uh, federal level but you know perhaps we get uh, uh, perhaps we leapfrog it but I, I would think that that that's going to be the movement and at that point uh, you're going to bring in regulators like the FDA and the FTC sort of the same regulators that are now dealing with uh, what has happened with uh, with hemp and CBD in particular um, and uh, I think that's really the way THC is going to go. And is that just just because it popped into my mind? Is that when you think you'll see the the big banks and the big institu institutions um, get behind the industry? Because, for example, in Canada, uh, you know, you have big institutional players and and our big five banks involved, some more than others. Um, but they don't they don't have that that federal concern that's that's existing, which I think has you know inhibited some of the bigger players in the U.S. from getting into the U.S. market. But they're happy to be in the Canadian market. Um, yeah, is that sort of the 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 gate opening there that 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 some folks are waiting for? Maybe then, even if it is just that that schedule two pro process. Yes, I think some things are happening in parallel. Uh, so you probably hear about the a lot about the Safe Banking Act. Um, that is a industry, um, it, the American Banking Administration uh, Association that has been pushing it to uh, give uh, banks some immunity for banking businesses that are state compliant. Uh, and it has support in the U.S. House. Uh, it's I don't know how if it has enough quite enough to get over the finish line in the U.S. Senate, which is more conservative than the House. Uh, but there are sort of enough uh, votes to have it in discussion. Uh, that will uh, get some of probably the more mid-sized banks into the business. Again, for a bank like Chase, I don't know if the uh, regulatory risk is worth um, you know, tangling with the industry quite yet. Um, even if, if that is in, in, in power, because uh, there's still uh, compliance obligations and uh, that just means more work for them. And But that will depress prices uh, likely when you have more entrants. Uh, yes, I think once um, there's a movement to schedule two, I think what will happen is you'll have some of the big entrants um, into the industry like big tobacco and big alcohol, uh, take some of the same bets they've made in Canada and make them in the United States. And once they go there, they will bring their bankers with them. Got No, that's, that's interesting. Uh, so really appreciate your time, Alex. And uh, I think maybe on our, on our follow-up or our next episode, well, I, I am interested to see how it works at within a state level. So sure. I think we've got some more to chat about uh, in, in the future. My pleasure. And uh, yes, I, you know, this was sort of, again, the very high level uh, view. There's only so much you can touch on, but it's, it's a fascinating topic and we'll, uh, we'll have more to talk about. Oh, for sure. Really appreciate it.